Hello, my name's Anna Davey. I originally made this presentation at the Asian Forensic Science Network meeting in 2019 in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. My presentation was the last of the day. And so when I was preparing the presentation, I undertook a risk assessment. My major risk, as I understood it at that stage, was that people would be tired by the end of the day and would be asleep during my presentation. Risk assessments are something we do all the time. We don't even realise we're doing them half the time. When I travelled to Ho Chi Minh City, I had to pick the airline that I was going to fly with. I did this on the basis of a number of factors. One was the cost, a second was the convenience, and the third was the reputation of the airline. I made a risk assessment to determine which airline I was going to use. I did a risk-benefit analysis, cost against the reputation of the airline. Sometimes when we're talking about risk assessments, we can go over the top. Risk assessments need to be fit for purpose. In this cartoon, we see an inappropriate risk assessment. This baby is no risk to anyone. As I mentioned, we take risks all the time. And we do risk assessments all the time. Think about going on a holiday and going mountain climbing. Mountain climbing, I'm told, can result in fantastic experiences. However, it can also result in disasters, death and injury. Trying new and exotic foods is something I really enjoy while I travel around the world. And I've discovered some really interesting new taste sensations. Unfortunately, sometimes unusual foods can cause you to become ill. So what does this have to do with forensic science? Well, when we're introducing a new technique, a new process, a new way of doing things, we have to weigh up the risks and the benefits. Let's think about the benefits first. This new process could increase greater efficiency and therefore throughput in the laboratory. There could be cost savings. The tests may be more sensitive or they may be more discriminating or they may result in getting the results more quickly. They're the benefits, but what about the risks? The risks of introducing a new process is that there might be a failure to locate items of interest at the scene or in the laboratory. You may obtain no analytical result where previously you might have obtained a result. You could provide an incorrect exclusion. You could provide an incorrect inclusion. The new process might introduce contamination or increase the chance of sample mix-up or the new process might introduce contextual bias. So we can see that it's important to weigh up the opportunity and the risks that any activity involves. This diagram is taken from the ISO standard, Risk Management Guidelines. And when first confronted with it, it looks extremely complex. However, if we break it down, we can see that it actually makes sense and it's actually representing what we're doing anyway. The next slide gives a common example of a risk assessment matrix. Again, at first glance, this looks extremely complicated, but we're gonna break it down and we can see that it's not that complicated. So if getting our heads around risk management and doing risk assessments is so problematic, why do we need to bother? Well, as I've previously indicated, we're doing it already. It's common sense. If we're going to cross the road, we look both ways. But more formally, it's actually now a requirement in ISO 17025. The 2017 edition of ISO 17025 says the following. The main changes 
compared to the previous edition are as follows. The risk-based thinking applied to this edition has enabled some reduction in prescriptive requirements and their replacement by performance-based requirements. What they're saying is that if you undertake a risk assessment, you can use that risk assessment to determine how and when you are going to undertake certain activities in your operations. This standard is no longer as prescriptive as the previous one is because you've undertaken a risk assessment in your laboratory, in your service, under your conditions, and so you can decide, based on that risk assessment, how you want to move forward. One of the advantages of doing a risk assessment, you're actually being proactive rather than reactive. You're thinking, what could go wrong? What could go right? Before you actually implement anything, rather than an evaluation at the end of the process or where something has gone wrong. That's not to say, of course, evaluations are not necessary, they are. But risk assessments allow you to be proactive. In the next few slides, I've actually copied and pasted various sections of 17025 2017 version. If you wish to read the content, of the next three slides, pause this video when you reach the slide. We can see in this slide that the forensic process is an end-to-end -end process. It starts with some form of scene examination. And at the scene, presumptive testing is undertaken and items are collected for further examination. Those items are then receipted. An exercise of triage is undertaken where the case is reviewed and the order of the examinations is determined. We then have the examination phase, which could include subsampling, analysis and case interpretation. The final step is reporting. Now I understand that not all services provide every one of these steps but someone provides these steps and the forensic process is an end-to-end -end process. So what we need to do is to determine what are the risks associated with these various steps in the process. This slide shows a photograph of some end-to-end -end process mapping that we undertook at the Myanmar DNA Forensic Laboratory. We broke each of these steps down to each individual activity and then worked out what the risk was for each one of these activities. To work out what the risk was, we used a risk assessment matrix. We determined for each of those activities where we had identified an issue, what was the probability of that actually occurring? And if it did occur, what was the consequence? Using those two pieces of information, we determined whether or not the risk was high, serious, medium, or low. Once we'd done that, we then had to work out what the, our response to those risks were. If the risks were low, then normal precautions could be taken. If the risk was medium, then the risk needed to be mitigated where possible and monitored where it's not possible to mitigate it. Where the risk is deemed to be serious, the risk needs to be mitigated where that's possible and monitored where it's not possible, but a high degree of precaution is required. Where the risk is deemed to be high, this process should be suspended until the risk can be reduced. I mentioned that for every step, we determined what the activities were and then determined what the risk was of each of those activities. We've got to be realistic. Remember I said that risk assessments need to be fit for purpose. That baby was no risk to anyone. The probability of the risks shown in this slide are extremely low and probably not worth considering. 
So let's look at some of the risks that we might encounter. Let's also identify what is the difference between a hazard and a risk. Stairs in a building are a hazard, but stairs in of themselves do not form a risk. The risk is falling or tripping. And the consequence of the falling or the tripping is an injury. Expired reagents in of themselves are not a risk. They can sit at the back of the cupboard and they're not going to do any harm to anyone. The risk is using those expired reagents. And the consequence is unreliable results. A hazard is in inadequate training. The risk is a result of inadequate training that is poor sample collection or lack of recognition of evidence. And this can lead to incorrect interpretation. Having no written procedure in itself is not an issue. However, the risk associated with not having a written procedure is that there will be a variation in the examination method used. And this could result in unreliable and inconsistent results. A piece of equipment sitting at the back of the bench not being used is not a hazard to anyone. The risk is that that piece of equipment will be used, leading to unreliable results or no results at all. Inadequate facilities is a hazard and can lead to risks such as poor storage or the possible contamination or tampering of items. These can lead to the loss and deterioration of material or compromised exhibits. A poor management system is a hazard. The risk with a poor management system is that there is a lack of direction for staff. It can lead to stress or overwork or confusion, all of which can lead to unreliable or inconsistent results. So what are the important factors in risk management? It needs to be flexible. Every organisation, every service is going to be different. It needs to be fit for purpose. You need to analyse your processes in a step-by-step -step manner. And remember, you won't get it right first time. Risk management allows for continuous improvement, continuous update, and it is essential that you involve everyone in the process. Just as risk management is built into our everyday life, whether we're crossing the street or trying some new foods, it needs to be built into every process in our laboratory or service. And one of the risks associated with undertaking a risk assessment is that you're going to miss a risk. Some of these risks you're going to miss are going to be highly unlikely, as demonstrated in this slide. However, that's why it's a continuous process. You need to continually review and update your risk assessments. I hope this presentation has been of some use to you. If you'd like to continue the discussion, please don't hesitate to contact me using the details on this slide. Thank you very much.